Welcome to Hard Questions. This is where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, I'm the moderator, and today our panelists include... Dr. William R. Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Ray Heipel, Providence Presbyterian Church in Robinson Township. Pete Giacalone, South Hills Assembly of God Church, Bethel Park, PA. J. Anthony Gilbert, pastor of Another Level in the North Hills area. Well, pastors, thank you for being with us today. And today on Hard Questions, we're taking on your questions from the hotline. I love it when we do this. They deal with everything from dogs in heaven to artificial intelligence. So let's get started with our first one. My question is, when do you just finally give up on a girl when you know that you've been working so hard for so many years and trying to make it work? I really need help with this. Thanks. Okay, Pastor Jay, why don't you take the first one? All right, grab your notepad and pen for the doctor of love. <laughs> the doctor of love is here. <laughs> He's in the house. He's in the house. He's in the house. <laughs> Y'all ready? ready? All right, doctor. Right. All right, All right doctor. Listen, Listen brother, paper. <laughs> this is the reality. There's so many different variables that we could take from this. Um, if you've been chasing somebody for years and years and years, you have to kind of determine in your heart. Mm. Uh, it's kind of like I heard one person say before that no journey is too great when one finds what they seek. Uh, so it depends on how bad you want this person. But if you are in an unhealthy relationship, Ooh, if you are in a place where you're codependent, if you're in a place where you're giving her and she's clearly communicating, first of all, either that she doesn't want you or secondly, that there are things that you want to see in her that you're not getting, then that's when you have to make a determination when to say when. And so a lot of times we stay with something for a long period of time because we're worried that God isn't gonna send us something different. Sometimes you have to ask yourself the question, are you settling? So one of the things I would also say to you as well, how many people in your world that love you feel this woman is a good pick for you? Uh, when I went through and I was getting ready to marry Pastor Tiffany, uh, I'll never forget how I went to her family, my family, everybody, because I wanted to get affirmation from people that loved me. Do you feel this is a good fit for me? Now at the end of the day, I'm not looking for everybody to tell me who to marry, but you, there are so many different variables that you can look at to determine whether or not this person is for you or not. So there's a few that you can do, and I'm sure these brothers are gonna to speak to some more of that. Yeah. Well, again, the first thing that comes to my mind is what's taking place in this relationship? Is Jesus Lord of this relationship? Does she know the Lord? Do you know the Lord? There's, there's too many variables here uh, where we're told not to be unequally, unequally yoked. Mm -hmm. So if she doesn't know the Lord, that, that's a, a check mark right there. Doesn't mean you can't lead her to the Lord. What do they call it? Missionary dating. Yeah. Um, so Don't engage in missionary dating, by the way, for the most Jesus. part. Yeah. So, there, there, again, there's too many variables, but to me, uh, the important thing is if Jesus isn't the center of it all, then you've got, you'll, you will continue to have major difficulties. Oh, he's got boy. The, I mean, isn't that the case oh, even for those of us that have been married yeah, for a long yeah, time? Yeah, yeah. Christ has yeah. to be the center of this, this one thing. One last thought. Yeah. Don't marry the one you can live with. Marry the one you can't live without. Oh, that's good. Uh, well, you know, I, I would say uh, if you're a Christian, and even if your lady is a Christian, and you are walking with God, in Philippians, Paul says, the peace of God, right. which passes all understanding, will keep your heart and mind. And if you, if you have lined up with the peace of God in your life, you go, and God is disturbing your peace, then this, you know, I mean, yeah. ultimately, it's God's will. Is this, is this God's will for your life? And if God is disturbing your peace, then evidently this is not the one for you. You know, if, if you feel like it's taking too long, uh, you know, well, why, why am I feeling uneasy about this? So I, I, would, I, I would put a lot of uh, weight on the fact that uh, God's peace in my life would, would help me mm -hmm. determine that decision, whether I should wait or whether I should give up. Well, I mean, emotions are all tied up in this, of course, and, and the desire for a great relationship. but that doesn't seem like it's happening here, right? What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I would say the purpose of dating ultimately is to get married. If you're a man, um, you're looking for a, at a woman for a relationship with her. I mean, you can't have sex outside of marriage. And so, you know, uh, you ought to be able to determine both of you whether or not you're going to be a good spouse for the other person. And, and if the answer is no, at that point, there's no reason to continue the relationship. I take young men out at our church all the time, if I find out they've been going out with a girl for a year or two years, I'm like, what are you doing? Either ask this girl to marry you or set her free because her future husband can't get to her if you're not gonna be that and you know that, 
you have no business dating her. So I would say to somebody, you know, if you're a believer and you're looking for a relationship, ultimately yeah. you're looking for a spouse. As soon as you determine that this person isn't that, you should allow them to find their spouse since it's yeah, not that's, you. That's really good. Wait, one one, one more comment from the doctor of love. <laughs> one more, <laughs> just real quickly, yeah. get premarital counseling. Yeah. Because sometimes they may be able to reveal some things that maybe yeah. you're not seeing that yeah. can sort through those emotions and maybe exactly. think with your head and not your heart. Right. So much, so much depends on your willingness to hear from other godly people on this. Great, great question. All right, let's go on to our next hotline question. First, I want to say uh, how much I enjoy your pro program, and I thank you. In Scripture, we read about the Antichrist and the Beast. Question is, is the beast a separate entity or will it be a part of the system that the Antichrist will implement, for example, possibly artificial intelligence, central bank, digital currency, or one world religion? Thank you again. Wow, there's a lot That's to sort lot. through there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> in a short, a short segment here, but we're going to do our best. Pastor Glaze. Well, you know, first of all, I want to start by saying that not everybody would have the same interpretation of who the beast of yeah. Revelation 13 right. is. So right. I'm given my interpretation. Yeah. Uh, but when you look at Revelation 13, there's actually two beasts. You know, there's the uh, first beast, which is the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And then there's the second beast, which is the false prophet. And the Bible says that the false prophet uh, actually, you know, goes out and does the bidding of the Antichrist. And that he even sets up an image and I believe that, you know, a lot of prophecy scholars today says that this image that he sets up is AI, is, is using artificial intelligence mm. so that uh, he's able to do a lot of things to influence people and to impact people. So, you know, to answer her question, you know, I would say that, you know, she says the beast, well, actually there's two beasts. Right. And so the, the, the first beast is the Antichrist. The second beast is the false prophet. And they kind of work in conjunction with each other. And I believe that they will, according to Revelation 13, 11 through 18, they will use artificial intelligence to uh, deceive and to promote their agenda. OK. And the question was, is the beast a separate identity? Mm -hmm. OK, here's what I came up with. In Revelation 19, 20, it says, the beast was captured, so it's got to be a, a separate identity, all right? Yeah. The beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in, the, in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped the image. These two were cast alive, so it is a separate identity. These two were cast alive. Then in Revelation chapter 20, 7 through 10, it says this, when a thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from prison will go to deceive the nations with four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is, all right. They went up uh, on the breath of the earth, and this is where I'm going. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast, who I believe is a separate identity, the beast and the false prophet are. So that's how my take so on it. So they're servants of the enemy, not they're, necessarily they are the enemy. a separate identity. Yeah. Okay. I, I believe that. Thoughts over here. Oh, you want to go? Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would, I would agree with what the brothers have said. I do think that, that um, as this age comes to an end, that there's going to be a culmination of evil. I think, you know, John talks about many antichrists have already come, and there's a sense right. in which the antichrist is whatever opposes Christ. So any false religion, any government that persecutes Christians, uh, Daniel 7 sees all uh, foreign governments as beasts. You know, there's the ram, there's the bear, there's the lion. You know, and, and so this monstrous power thing, but it does seem like that there's going to be a person. Uh, and I agree with you, Dr. Glaze and, and Pete, you know, there, there are two beasts. And I think that that culmination is coming and, and Satan's going to do whatever he can do to oppose Christ and to persecute Christians. So it, it might be something like, you know, what we're seeing now with AI or whatever, but whatever he can do, whatever God lets him do, um, he's going to do to, to oppose God. And yeah. so, you know, we don't need to get caught up in trying to figure it out. I think what we need to do is trust God and continue to, continue to witness to the gospel until he wraps things up. For sure. Yeah. I wish we had about seven more minutes, but I know we well, don't. We got like I know. <laughs> I'm gonna make it quick. AI, I believe, is the way of the future. The whole thing with yeah. cookies, I wish I had time to do it. That's already starting it. In my opinion, it's starting to track you. Way of the future in a, in a bad sense. In a good sense. You gotta ask yourself sense. with AI, are you gonna use AI as a tool or are you gonna become a tool of AI? Right. So you're gonna have an option yeah. to pick which one you're gonna do. Let me go to the one world religion real quick. I believe we're already seeing that. I believe that when the church is raptured out, I believe that another Christ is going to come up. 
Okay. And what do I mean by that? That whole thing right now, I know I'm going to step on some toes with that. Thing, but Christ. he gets us. Yeah. yeah. Another form that's not Jesus. Yeah. He's going to appear. That whole thing about he gets us right now. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. Hope people understand that. If you looked at Jesus never washed the world's feet. He washed his disciples' feet. There's a lot of things that are coming up. This whole thing about love. It's all going to come under the umbrella. And I believe the Antichrist is also going to present himself as the Christ because that's why he's eventually going to get the abomination of desolation. So I believe we're already moving in that direction. But I know There's we got to go. a lot in 30 seconds there, brother. I know, I know, it's I know, a lot to answer in, in a short segment. I hope we did a good job for you. Well, coming up in 60 seconds, we ask, will there be a place for my dog in heaven? Stay tuned. Welcome back to Hard Questions. We're taking your calls from the Hard Question Hotline. If you would like to leave us your question, I hope you do. We encourage you to call 412-349-4326. We'd love to answer your question on the air. Let's go to the next one. Will there be a place in heaven for my dog? Okay, well, this is one we get fairly often, and it's an interesting question, Pastor Glaze. Yeah, I, I was uh, talking earlier about we should do a, a hard questions book where we answer questions, and this definitely would be a question that would, <laughs> would be in there because yes. we get this one quite a bit. Uh, but, you know, I, I, first of all, I want to say that the scripture does not say whether your pet will be in heaven or not. Uh, so I think that we have to, you know, go to other scriptures to kind of draw some analogy. And I always go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 21, where Solomon writes, Who knows the spirit of a man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? And, and so, you know, many theologians believe that it's because we all have a soul. You know, when I say soul, I mean life. We all have life. And so the spirit of an of a individual, a human being, goes upward, whereas the spirit of the beast, it says, goes downward. And I, so this is my personal interpretation. So don't write Tom and, and blast him. But, uh, you know, right I... Pastor Glaze. Yeah, right. That's William so, R. Glaze. <laughs> right. So I would say that the, the, that the soul of a beast, you know, becomes extinct at, at death. You know, okay. I, I think that, you know, that's it for the soul of the beast. Now... Uh, there are animals in heaven because when Jesus comes back, he's coming back on a, on a horse. So we know that there are animals the in heaven. lay down with the lion, right? Right. So, yeah. So, yeah. you know, uh, I mean, if God, you know, first of all, why, you know, why do you need your pet there? You know, Jesus is going to be the center of our, God is going to be our focus. You know, it's, there's going to be fullness of joy that any needs that you have will be totally met, you know, in the Lord. So, you know, I would ask the question, you know, why would you need your pet there? That's a good point. Good point. Who else is going to jump in here on this? Well, you know, it's sad. Something about pets. So, you know, we're, we're pe and we're seeing more and more of it today, what people are spending on pets. Something about pets that people just, you know, and I said this to somebody, and I'm going to be very transparent here. I think we cried harder, my wife and I, when we lost our favorite pet than a family member when it died. Yeah. Isn't that sad? Because we know where the family members. the names. Yeah. I'm not going to make any names. You know what, Pete? Let me jump off of that for just a and second. And I, and I rebuke myself for that. But I mean, I, I you, do wanna... you fall apart. I, yeah, I know. And we love hard. our pets. Yeah, and I, sure. I, I just want to make a real quick commentary. I'm glad that we all love our pets. And we do get this question yeah. very yeah. often. Yeah. And they're part of the family. I get that. But God is more. Oh, I, God yes, is. More, yes, God agree. is more concerned with us loving our neighbor. There you go. Whether Whoa. our neighbor is going to be in heaven oh, or not, yeah. there you point, than it is point, about too. whether our dog is going to be in heaven. That's a or good not. rebuke. And and I think that I don't want it to be harsh, and I don't want it to be a rebuke. No. But I think we just we just need to we remember need to that. Wow. Yeah. I think I'm gonna move on to the next question here. If it's all right with you guys, call but Tom. Don't call no, me. <laughs> no, that no. Listen, I get it. It's you know yeah. we all do love our pets, and certainly people get very very close to their. It seems like dogs, especially. I don't know my yeah. cat. Cats, my, no, no, my cat. cat I, I cats really like my cat, cat, but I, my cat wouldn't care one bit if, if whether uh, I was in heaven with her or what, not. What, 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 what if you had a vicious pit bull that went around biting people with it? <laughs> No, no, just, uh, no, no, that's another yeah. camera. <laughs> they go down. Didn't you say the beast spirit goes down? That one definitely. 
<laughs> anyway, moving right along here. Let's go to the next question. Was Jesus' spirit in heaven with God when it was decided to send him to earth as an infant? All right, well, this speaks a, a lot to some uh, one major doctrine uh, of the church, the Trinity, yeah. and what yeah. this means. Pastor Jay. Uh, yes, I believe that um, it was not in heaven. Um, in order to classify him as a man, he came 100% God, 100% man. In order to be a man, man is a spirit, possesses a soul, lives in a body. So it wasn't like Jesus was a different entity and his spirit was up in heaven. The Bible says he came down and he was in there. That's, that's a hard thing for a lot of people to comprehend. How is he 100% God and 100% man? And we've talked about that yeah. before on here. Yeah. But uh, no, he was not in heaven and there was like a separate Jesus there. Matter of fact, Jesus even said when he left, he said, I have to go. So then- Wait, but Just to make sure we're clear here, sure. I thought she was asking is, was he in heaven before he came to earth and, and then his, as a spirit? Are you saying that? Oh yeah, before yeah, I thought before. she. I thought she was saying when he came, yeah. what did his spirit maybe stay I misunderstood what she said. Am I answering it wrong? Well, it says, I, was, I, was Jesus spirit in heaven with God when it was decided? So in other words, was Jesus with him from the beginning? Oh, I'm sorry, that read it. Well, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then I apologize. Okay. I thought it meant did it stay there when he came down? But you're distinctly yes. speaking to the idea that he was 100 percent God, 100 percent man. Correct. Ray, do you want, yeah, want to share? Yeah, and I didn't see that aspect of it, but from what you're, you're talking about his human soul, his human soul didn't come into existence until he's created. Correct. Uh, I took it in the sense of the Christological idea of Christ as God and Christ as man. And uh, as God, he eternally was with right. the Father. Right. And right. he was uh, with the Father, not only uh, when he was incarnated, but even during the incarnation. And Christ right. as God is everywhere. Uh, you, you see some, even some passages that say this, John 1, 48, Nathanael came to him and said, how do you know me? Jesus said, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So yeah. Jesus was with yeah. Nathanael a as God already, but at the same time in his human nature, he was constricted to wherever he was as a man. And so we've got to keep those two things separate. Christ himself says in John three thirteen, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, and then listen to this, that is the son of man who is in heaven. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is saying, mm -hmm. I'm in heaven. Yeah. And there's a reality to that, that as God, yes, he was in heaven, he was on, in hell, he was at the bottom of the ocean, he's everywhere. But as a human being, he was only in the womb of Mary. And then he was only outside the womb of Mary. And then he was only on the cross and so mm -hmm. forth. Oh, good point. Yeah. He was with him from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, again, it's the deity of Christ. You know, he was God, he is God, and he'll always be God. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I can't add too much to what's already been said other than John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's you know, right. So from the very beginning, he was, he was there with because God. Because some people have this concept that, that Jesus became God. You know what I mean? And, and, but I think like if you... Like a modal concept, like he, he wasn't really, or he gave... Yeah, there's so much to it there, but it all it kind of uh, is around that doctrine of the Trinity that's so important and vital to understanding the deity of Christ and who he really is. Well, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we're gonna ask, what is a graven image? Stay tuned. Welcome back. Uh, let's take our last hotline question. My question is, what defines an engraving image? In the Bible, it says you, you can't uh, have an engraving image. What about uh, like a statue of Jesus? Okay, this is something that actually uh, comes up uh, various times. People wonder about that, mm -hmm. Pete. Uh, what, what do you? Well, uh, what's well, your take on this? Well, what my take on it is, first of all, graven image is something a carved idol to be used in worship. So if you have an image of Jesus in your house that to be used in worship, I mean, if we were to go to the exact uh, letter of the law, uh, I think it has to do with practicing worshiping. Uh, you know what I'm trying to say? And then I know we've talked about this before, about the, the pictures of Jesus. You have this blonde haired, blue eyed picture of Jesus and that, that has nothing to do with the culture that Jesus was raised in. I, I think the major emphasis, emphasis is when it becomes worship, when it becomes, you know, people- Of that object. Of that object. I yeah. think there's where the danger is. 
but we all have some type of, whether it's a cross, uh, if you come I, at my office at home, I have an amazing picture of Jesus just laughing, you know, yeah. of what we think Jesus may have looked like. And it's not blonde hair, blue eyes. Right? Okay. Uh, it's dark skin, dark eyes. So, so I, think, I think the emphasis is worshiping when, yeah. when it becomes a worship. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, and I know in all of our neighborhoods, we have, we see people with statues right. of Mary out in the yard and, you know, yeah. sometimes there's yeah. images of Jesus. And, you know, to me, I, I would like to go and ask that person, why do you have that statue out there? Mm. You know, if they, if they have it out there as a reminder right. of something, you know, meaningful to them, you know, that's one thing. But if, if they think that the statue is going to bring some kind of special blessing yeah. by having it out there in the yard, or if they, you know, in some degree, you know, as Pete said, if they're worshiping, you know, and giving allegiance to that, then I, I think that that's where the problem comes in. You know, it's, it's not necessarily the, the carved image, but it's where your heart is yeah. in relationship to that image. You know, personally, you know, I wouldn't put one out there because, you know, it, it would not have any meaning to me. You know, you know, the meaning for me is having Christ in my heart, Amen. you know, so and, yeah. and I think that that's where my worship is at. But some people, uh, Christians, pastors even, have trouble sometimes with images of Christ. I've heard people right. Right. even preach against it, not having an image because we don't know what Christ looked like. Where do you come down on this? You know, I think uh, I'm going to do a 21st century dive into it. Because people say, well, I, they don't see many graven images today that we would worship. But I think anything, if you notice about the graven image, something that was made by the hands of man, mm -hmm. that they said, this is my God. So yeah. how would I break that down for today? Your graven image could be an iPhone. There you go. Yeah. It could be anything at all that was created by man that you put ahead of God. Mm -hmm. Anything at all. I mean, anything that was created that you're saying, this is where my sustenance comes. This is where my strength comes from. This is where everything that I have and who I am comes from. So we have to be careful that it's like, well, I don't have anything that I chiseled out with rock and said, okay, I'm going to bow down and do this obedience to it or something like that. That's not what it's, it's, it's saying for the 21st century. It could be anything created by our hands, by man's hands, mm -hmm. that we say, this is what I hail to. This yeah. is what I worship. And I think that can be a graven image in our day today. That is such a good point because throughout history though, through the scriptural history and throughout just history in general, images have meant a lot in yeah. cultures, yeah. graven images. Yeah. They always seemed to worship a graven image, whether it was a wooden deity or whether it was something out of stone. So, I mean, they're making a, a strong statement here. That's not who we worship. Yeah, the commandment uh, is in Exodus 20, verse 4, you shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. Mm -hmm. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So I, I agree with you, gentlemen, that the, the real uh, uh, specific thing here is the worship, worship of those things because the command is to make any image of anything. Right. You know, a cup, a table, you know, a, a collar, a, you know, whatever, yeah. um, anything, anything in heaven, anything on earth, anything mm -hmm. under the earth. Uh, therefore, it, it can't mean you can't make an image. It means you can't worship. Uh, historically, mm -hmm. though, and I wasn't sure if the caller was talking about this, you know, between the Eastern and Western churches uh, in the first millennium, especially in the ninth century, you have uh, the iconoclastic controversy where, you know, if you go into an Orthodox church, you won't see statues. You see the icons. They're flat. Uh, that's because they, they take this graven mm -hmm. as being something that um, is, is what makes the image wrong. Hard. So like in yeah. the Roman, you know, in, in Catholic churches and Byzantine churches, you'll see these statues. The Orthodox will just have their flat icons. And, uh, you know, I think, again, uh, th that's missing the, the thrust of the command, which is worship. You know, you can worship this cup. You can worship an idea and it's, a, it's an idol. Paul talks about idols being things like fornication, uncleanness, mm -hmm. passion, evil desire, which is idolatry. You know, that's an image when you have uh, uh, anything that you put in the place of God. So, you know, I think when we get caught up over whether or not we can have a picture of Jesus or a statue of Jesus, we're missing the issue. The issue is, are you worshiping God? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you worshiping God? Not worshiping. I, I definitely don't worship my cup, my cup unless it's got coffee in it and I need it really bad. Uh, but no, that, that's, a, that's such a, an important point is because people can, can sort of get bent out of shape about these things. But the key is, what are we worshiping, right? I mean, are we in agreement with that? Okay. What is it that we are worshiping? Hopefully, we're not worshiping an image. 
and praying to an image. We're praying to the living God, mm. the God who really lives and really loves us. And Tom, even, yeah. even if we use an image to worship God, a lot of times it's said that way. Well, I'm not praying to the yeah. statue. I'm praying to God through the statue. Yeah. You know, that's really what the second commandment is. The first commandment is no other gods before me. The second commandment is don't worship me, the true God, through idols. In a sense, that's what Israel did with the golden yeah. calf. They said, this is yeah. Jehovah. Yeah. And that's why it was wrong to do that. Wow, wow, good yeah. point, Ray. Appreciate that. Well, we like to end the program with a scripture. And today we go to Psalms where it says this, answer me, Lord, out of the goodness of your love and your great mercy turn to me. This is Psalm 69, 16. I want to uh, ask uh, one of the pastors about that word mercy. Can you, Pastor Glaze, can you give me a, a definition of the word mercy? What does that mean to you? Well, the, the Greek, I mean, the Hebrew word is hesed, which is God's unfailing love, God's steadfast love. It never fails. It always reaches out. When we get tired and we can't hold on, hesed holds on to us. Praise the Lord. I love that. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's program and we want to hear from you. Email us your questions at hardquestions at ctvn.org or call into our hotline at 412-349-4326. We'll see you next time.